Welcome to the Global Travel Channel Podcast Show. I'm your host, Mark Philpot, and today I have another great guest lined up for you. I don't know about you, but I love trekking in the mountains, and today's guest is going to talk to us about an extraordinary challenge that he and his wife are taking on all over the world over a couple of years. So why don't we get straight into the show and introduce you to my guest today. It's a very warm welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show to Mr. Trevor Builder. Trevor, welcome welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Now, how are you today? All right? Good, thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a great day. And uh, what's interesting is World Mental Health Day, so uh, more important to get out to the outdoors and enjoy. I'm, gl- I'm glad I asked you how you were then, because yes, thank uh, you. that rolls into that. So I'm glad to hear you well. Where are you talking to us from today? I'm talking to you from cloudy Sydney, um, although it's a bit sunny at the moment. So Sydney, Australia, where, where I call home. Fantastic, but um, we'll get into that a little bit later because it hasn't always been your home. But first of all, are you a first-time podcaster? Look, look, not. Well, I've done a couple of local ones, but this is the first time I've ever appeared on a global one. So there you go. Well, welcome to the international uh, mindset and uh, audience because we've Thank got you. people listening in over. We hit the big eighty yesterday, so eighty countries around the world as as of today. Fantastic. Now I'm going to ask you um, something a little bit special that I like to do with my guests now, which is to ask you to dedicate the show to somebody in your life that means a lot to you. So who would you like to dedicate this particular show to? I'll dedicate it to my partner, Emma, who I'm uh, doing this project with. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Emma, this is a shout out for you and uh, something you'll be able to keep as a memory for the rest of your, your times together. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now we're going to be talking a lot about trekking and a very specific trekking challenge that you're in the process of of doing it at the, at the moment, Trevor, but I'm going to start off by reading a few words to you. It's a quote actually from a very famous mountaineer, and I want to know whether you can tell me who said these words. And the words are, mountains don't kill people, they just sit there. Well, I'll, go, I'll go to have a guess. Um, <laughs> a famous mountaineer, perhaps a New Zealander, uh, maybe Sir Edmund Hillary. No, you'd be wrong, mate. It's okay, actually an Ameri- it's actually an American guy called Ed Vistas. Ah, Ed Vistas. Yes, yes. Okay. Yep, and I, cho- I, ch- I chose that because Ed's the only American to climb all fourteen of the world's eight thousand meter peaks. Did you know that? Um, I did know that. Yes, yes. And uh, only the fifth person to do so without oxygen. So a fairly yeah. serious um, and intense mountaineer. An amazing feat. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Now your project is called Project Base 8000, so why don't you start off by telling us what that is and how it actually came into being. Sure, so our aim is to trek to the base camps of all the world's highest mountains over 8000 metres, which happen to be 14 of them. Uh, seven of those are in Nepal, two in Tibet, we, we've just uh, finished, and five are in Pakistan. So our aim is to be the first people or non-mountaineers to trek to all 14 base camps and to put that into perspective there's only been 42 mountaineers to date that have summited all 14 8,000 meter mountains including Ed Vistas. Mm, amazing. Now have you been into trekking and mountaineering for a long time in your life? i um, always had um, I guess outdoor uh, emphasis or focus. Um, in terms of trekking, you know, apart from local treks in, in Australia and New Zealand, in terms of the Himalayas, we've been doing that since 2013. So becoming a bit of a, a stalwart in, in, that, in that area. Mm. So the Himalayas in that area you just mentioned, in particular where these 14 peaks are located, is a very famous part of the world for that kind of thing. Have, have you been to other parts of the world as well doing trekking? We have, uh, you know, Europe, North America, um, obviously New Zealand being on our back doorstep, Australia. Mm. Australia being a little bit flatter than the rest of the world. Right. I think our highest, our highest hill or peak is Mount Kosciuszko, uh, which is right just over 2,000 metres. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, the Himalayas, I guess, keeps on drawing you back. And I, when I say the Himalayas, you also got the Karakoram Ranges in Pakistan as well, so, which is an extension of the Himalayas. So, you know, it's just one of those things that uh, once you see them, I think you get hooked. And uh, talking to a lot of people, as first-time visitors, they go back, you know, two, three, four, five times, um, like us, probably about eight or nine times, and still going back. Mm. Now, um, your partner Emma is a Kiwi, 
and yes. I'm sure that's been a large part of the draw card to go to New Zealand to do some of the great walks over there. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. So and what plus ones? In... Plus, there's no snakes. There's no snakes. No, there's a, there's actually um, New Zealand's devoid of a lot of things that are kill you. Actually, that's right. Except that's right. for ice cream and fish and chips. We'll that's talk right. about we'll talk about those things later. So what about some of the um, nice walks you've done in New Zealand? Anything that sticks to mind that you can share with the audience today? Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, the Tongariro Crossing. We've done that in both winter and summer in the North Island. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing, amazing trek in itself. How long did uh, that take you? That one. Oh, around six or seven hours. It's, it's a day trek, but in winter it's very dicey because um, the weather conditions can play a big part and, you know, you get snow and ice. So sometimes you have to wear crampons, uh, but also take all your winter gear as well. So, and an ice axe. Mm. So it's a completely different trek to say in summer. Um, and then and obviously in the South Island, you know, the two famous ones, part of the Great Walks, they call it, uh, Milford Track and the Rootburn, mm. um, plus, plus, a, plus a plethora of others. But they're the three that really stand out for us in terms of just being out there and um and seeing seeing the mountains for what they are now in terms of the ones in the south islands that you've just mentioned those ones are over several days uh what, what do you prefer doing do you prefer to be out there for you know a week trekking along or do you like the day stuff as well oh a bit of you know the, op the option to do both i mean i think if you're short on time day treks are great um half day treks um but if you've got time up your sleeve you know three five day Hiking, trekking, tramping, as they call it in New Zealand, is fun. Mm. Uh, there's nothing, nothing better than throwing on a backpack uh, with a tent, um, and off you go. And um, that's the great thing about some of the stuff that we do. You can, you can do it yourself. Um, in the Himalayas um, and the Curry Corns, it's always recommended to have a guide, um, both because you're supporting the local economy, but two, it can get dicey up there if you don't know what you're doing. So, um, you know, we've always, when we've trekked in the Himalayas and uh, Pakistan next year, we'll always be going with a guided expedition. And uh, that way they take care of the logistics and uh, anything else that happens on the ground. So all you really think about is where you're going to go from day to day. Mm. Has trekking been something that's been a long-term thing in your life or were you into other sports, uh, you know, when you were a bit younger? Always played sport, um, you know, um, sort of being an Australian. The Australian was football and cricket, summer and winter. Um, but I've you know, dabbled in, in field hockey as well, so always been active in my whole life. I mean, with the trekking um, side of it, it first came about for me back in 2009-10 when I took my son and daughter up to Mount Kinabalu in Borneo, which you may be familiar with. Mm. And um, so that was where I first got into, I guess, serious stuff and, and also with altitude. Emma, you know, being from New Zealand, has always been into the tramping side, so... You know, it's part of the school curriculum over there, go, go off tramping. Mm. So, but in 2013, we decided to go, both of us decided to go to the Himalayas and celebrate the 60th um, anniversary of Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary climbing Mount Everest. So, oh, right. Um, and as I said, once, 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 once bitten, twice shy. So basically, uh, you know, go back again and again and again and again. So uh, I think we've been going back nine or 10, nine or 10 times, you know, twice a year. So it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Look, being a very proud New Zealander, uh, I, I, grow, I grew up with the iconic figure of Sir Edmund Hillary. I'm interested to know from someone like you who visits that part of the world, is he, is he still revered over there in Nepal? Is he, is he someone that's bigger than life in that part of the world? Absolutely. I mean, he, he basically helped establish the whole Kumbu Valley by building schools, local schools, um, hospitals and the like. And they... Um, the famous airport of Lukla um, is named after him. So, you know, without his perseverance, money, um, forthright uh, views of the world and, and vision, that, that would never have been built, that airstrip. Mm. And um, so, you know, the Himalayas owe a lot to him. Um, as a matter of fact, that's a good point because through our project, we've actually formed a partnership with the Australian Himalayan Foundation and uh, because we wanted to give back to the Himalayas and that's one way of giving back through education, health, and the environment. Mm. So is this Project Base 8000, is this a full-time gig for you and Emma, is it? Do you have other jobs? Um, uh, yeah, a few, few bits and pieces on the side, but yeah, it's a full-time gig. I mean, it's, it's our focus, it's our, our project, our venture. Um, you know, at the back of this, I want to write a book. Mm. Um, and, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna call that mental is everything, because everyone tells us we're mental to be doing this and crazy <laughs> and all that. So, so why not call the book uh, Mental is Everything? And um, and write about their exploits because at the end of the day this isn't about box ticking this isn't about us it's about 
wanting people to come with us, join us, but more importantly, uh, for other people to, to follow in our footsteps. Okay, so it's a it's a kind of a movement that you're opening up for people and other opportunities to come and join you on these different tricks and you've already started them. So how many have you done so far to getting to base camp of these these 14 particular mountains? So we've done six so far, um, yeah. with eight to go. Uh, next year is our big year because one of the things that we wanted to do uh, with the project is put that end date on it. We didn't want to sort of say, oh, we're aiming to do all 14 and you know, don't know when we'll do it, but we'll do it. So we've actually set a very ambitious project um, and that's to complete all the 14 by the end of next year. Okay, and when did you actually start it? When was the first one done? Well, unofficially we, we started in 2013. We did our first trek to Everest Base Camp and uh, went back a couple of times actually. And then it was only last year, um, we got back from the Himalayas sort of uh, April, May last year. and. Um, we thought there's something missing here. We, you know, we we need a bit of focus in our life. Um, you know, did a bit of research, um, and then we came across the fact that no one's ever trekked. You know, every, every, as I said, there's only been 42 summits of all the 14 8,000 meters mountains, but no one's actually physically trekked, as in trekkers, to all these base camps. And more importantly, uh, for us, we wanted to also set another target, and that is why not go in the climbing expedition? So actually go higher. Than the base camps and we've done that a couple of times now and probably do a few more like that okay so i'm i'm hearing targets goals kpis all that sort of thing what did you do <laughs> what did you do for a gig before you got into this stuff uh the, the old corporate life the old corporate <laughs> life so so look i think it's actually interesting because i'm a firm believer that what we and, and emma was in technology in banking and i was in sales and marketing working for software companies so we've been able to blend all those skills and the skills I guess you take for granted in your life because you're, you're going through your corporate life, you're going through your daily gigs, um, you know, sometimes going, oh, do I really need to do this job or whatever. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of what we've learned in the corporate life and taken out and put this into our project. Things like, um, you know, how to deal with people on a day-to-day -day basis and mm -hmm. people of, of all different persuasions from different countries. Some some that can speak English, some that can't. So how do you communicate with someone that can't speak English? The best way you do, you know, you use sign language or um, maybe through an interpreter, but a lot of the times it's just gesturing or pointing or, or, or laughing. You know, I find laughing is the best best way to break any ice, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, problem solving, strategizing, uh, looking at options, uh, resilience. Um, but, but I guess the most important one for us is follow your dreams, follow your passion, you know, take a chance because if you don't, you don't know where that leads. I like this and I, I'd like to us to, to chat about this a little bit further because there's a lot of people that listen to my show who are in that transition phase, let's call it that. And they might be uh, in the corporate sector today. They're listening to these inspiring people coming on my show who have not only done something significantly inspiring in the travel space, but they've also changed their life along the way and you're obviously another example of that so can you talk to us around that transition process and maybe things like how long did it take you to do the transition what were some of the speed bumps along the way and and maybe even today what are some of the the legacies of those speed bumps can you share some of that with us yeah sure look i think for, for us um we were at a stage where i guess we were looking for another challenge and and having busy corporate lives um obviously in Australia, you get four weeks leave a year, and um, you know that's that's all the all the options you had. So to be able to enable us to do this project, um, we would have to do it sort of fairly full time and very very focused as well. So, but look, as I said, there's a lot you can take out of your corporate life. I mean, don't be afraid to take chances. Is one, um, you know, there's a famous uh, company out there that, in shoes that you know just do it. I'm a firm believer, just do it. You know, dip your toes in the water and uh, you don't know where that leads and you know look you can transition too look i'm not i'm not suggesting that you throw in your job tomorrow and start you know, a project or, or or some other you know you can transition you can maybe reduce your hours or your days um and, and think about it but how, I mean, did, how, did, how did you do it did you cut the umbilical cord overnight or did you take some time to weave yourself out of it um we 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 cut it overnight basically i mean i think I think we had a, the project wasn't in our mind then. We wanted to do a lot more trekking. So, but when we came up with this, or conceived the project last year, yeah, I mean, we were very focused on uh, other stuff that we're doing, like building a website, for example. 
Um, so a lot of, a lot of, again, a lot of those skills that you learn in the corporate role, you can use them in another role. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of employers these days are encouraging people to think outside their current role, you know, go and take on a board position or a volunteer position or, or do something else. So it actually rounds out their skills and by bringing that back to the employer sometimes can help them as well. So, you know, one, one of the things that we've we found and, and I'm sure other people have done this too is a project gives you purpose, a focus in life instead of meandering, you know, the nine to five, uh, well, maybe there's no such thing as nine to five, but you know what I mean. It's, it's getting to that, that daily routine, working five days or six days a week um, and rocking up. And, you know, we come across a lot of people of all ages and persuasions that basically say to us, look, we envy you, I wish we could do that. And we say to people, well, you can. I mean, mm. it's, it's, not, it's not impossible. Mm. I mean, everyone says, oh, you need lots of money. You don't really need lots of money. Um, you just need a bit of focus and, and more importantly, um, just, 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 you know, as I said, get, get out there, just do it. Um, when you embrace it, I mean, a lot of people that have done it, embrace it, um, look back and say, hey, wish I had done this, you know, 12 months, two years ago. So, so for couples that are listening to the show and, and you did this as a couple, did you do it at the same time? Did you both leave your, your corporate roles and, and, and get off together or did you do it progressively over a period of time as far as that side goes? Yeah, we're sort of within 12 months of each other. Um, I, I sort of threw in the towel in my, my particular role and then uh, I think Emma saw I was having too much fun. <laughs> so she decided to sort of throw in hers. But yeah, look, we'd, we'd, we'd planned it out a little bit um, in terms of what we wanted to do. But as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things to think about doing things. It's another thing in executing it. Now, when I did this, I quickly realized that there was also a transition in the people that you attract in your life and, and the relationships that you had before in the corporate world tend to either change or some of them even go away. How's that been for you? Oh, look, um, difficult at first. You do miss the interaction of the people that you work with and also the clients or prospects um, in helping them, you know, solve problems or come up with solutions. So, you know, working for some big multinational companies that took a while to transition out of that role. Um, and when I say a while, probably one or two months, but you know, you, the important thing is keep in touch with the people that you used to work with and they can still bounce ideas around. And, and I'm sure over time, you know, you've built relationships. And I think that's the important thing too. You have a, a branding that you may have built up in your corporate life don't be afraid to leverage that branding, that personal branding, because I see, I see some of the stuff that we're doing, and I talk to some of the people I used to do business with or ex people that I used to work with, and now we've got their interest, their interest has been peaked, and now they might go off and do their own thing, that's fantastic. Uh, they might go, hey, we wouldn't mind coming with you on this trek, let's do it. So I think um, you know the opportunities that you create in your own life whether it be personal life or corporate life, you know, you can bring them with you. And um, it's quite exciting when you talk to lots of people um, that are actually thinking about going on a trek, for example, that, that you know, go, yeah, this is, this is great stuff. I want to I have a crack at it. Mm. Did you find that your identity was linked in a large part to the corporate world and what you belonged to then after you left? Not, no, not at all. I mean, I think I mean, there's always this, this thing about a stigma attached to say, look, your brand is your corporate brand, you know, you, you, mm. you are the corporate. I, I don't think that's true anymore. I think a lot of people are experimenting. A lot of people are going out there and trying different things. I mean, you know, uh, I think back when I was in the corporate life, you might have had two, three, four jobs for life type of thing. You know, you might move around every eight or 10 years, but now, you know, people are moving around every couple of years. So I think it gives them an opportunity to, to go and explore other areas of their life. Um, in the corporate world. So, yeah, there's a, lo there's a lot of synergies I see in the corporate world in terms of what we're doing as, as opposed to going back into that, you know, that life again. Mm. Listen, thanks very much for sharing that part of your journey because as I say, there's a lot of people listening who are on the precipice or abyss of jumping into doing something different in their lives around travel and, and doing things like you are. So I'm sure they gained a lot of good stuff from what you just shared. So thanks very much for going there. It's okay, anytime. Okay, let's get back into the mountains and Project Base 8000 is an extraordinary goal really to think that you want to get to the base camp of these 14 major peaks around the world. You've um, 
Dun Everest first, I find that quite fascinating. If I was a betting guy, I would have sat down and thought most people would probably have left that to last to um, use it as the, the crescendo. So um, how, how's your thought process around you've already done Everest? Oh, look, it, it's, it's not a hard trek. I mean, you still have to prepare mentally uh, from both the physical and the mental point of view. Um, and it's also altitude. So you have to really think about that. There's a, lot, you know, there's a lot of people that don't really think about that. They just go and tackle it as a walk, but it's a serious walk. And, and sometimes uh, we've seen people uh, not make it um, and, and in a bad way too, um, you know, not, not just being evacuated. So, I mean, I, I, for us, I guess because it was the 60th anniversary, Emma being ex-New Zealand, um, you know, so Edmund Hillary's involvement, it was a no-brainer. Um, yep. You know, just just go and do it. Um, yeah, look, look. I think a lot of people um, that we talked to have tackled, say, the Annapurna, Annapurna's, which is another famous trek in the Himalayas. A great, a great trek. We, we're going to be doing that in uh, in May. Mm. So, so I would encourage people. You know, you don't have to do every space campus first up in the Himalayas. I mean, there's other things you can do as well. There's there's day treks. There's, there's you know, two or three other different tracks you could do. I mean, I think the important thing for us was, was we hadn't conceived this project at the time anyway. So that's that's one, you know, we just did that on off the back. Now yeah. we've got the project, um, you know, it's different. So, you know, we've, we've now tackled what I would argue, apart from Pakistan, um, now tackled two of the hardest base camps um, on our 8,000 metre one, that was Kanchenjunga out east. Mm -hmm. and it's so, re so remote you don't ever see anybody for days and days and days if not for the three weeks that you're out there yeah and the other one was makalu which is to the west um and makalu uh, was near everest but um it's about 19 kilometers i think southeast of everest but makalu was hard and it was remote there was a lot of snow when we did it um unseasonal even the locals were saying that so you know you had snow up to your waist mm -hmm. and sometimes breaking snow and uh you know for for a trekkers from Australia that aren't used to snow, um, you know, it was a, it was a challenge. Mm. And um, we set ourselves a challenge on that one too, to go to what we call the advanced base camps, up to 5,800 metres. Now, no trekkers, only climbers, ever go to advanced base camp on Makalu with a climbers base themselves. So, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. Every, every mountain that we've ever visited or, or tackled um, from a trekking point of view has its own challenges. You know, not one is the same. You can never assume when you go out there that, especially in the mountains, that you know it's going to have a beautiful bluebird day, so to speak. Mm. Um, you know, you'll get always go prepared because the mountains have a habit of biting you when you least expect it. Yeah, well, as Ed Vista said, they just sit there, right? It's the humans that make the mistakes. Yep, and and I saw a quote the other day, and, I, and I'm just trying to remember who it was, but climb the mountain. I think the quote was climb the mountain not to plant your flag but to embrace the challenge, enjoy the air, and behold the view. Mm. And, and more importantly, climb it so that you can see the world, not so the world can see you. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're a mountain climber or a trekker. That is so true. You know, and, and you now we're not doing this to tick a, tick a box, as I said earlier. We're not there to tick a box. We're not there uh, to brag about it. We're there because obviously the mountains are there, but more importantly, to experience it. And I think that's the important thing. Cool. I want to play devil's advocate for a second. Oh. I had a friend uh, have a chat to me before um, I did the show with you today, and she said to me, well, hang on a minute, that sounds like going down to the shopping mall and not actually going in shopping when you're just going to, to these base camps. So <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your take on that? Yeah, look, look I, can, I can relate to that. I think there's been times when we've got up to, you know, just under 6,000 metres and the, and the mountain's just over 8,000 metres, um, and you go, hmm, that's just there. But uh, that, you know, I can honestly say what we did was, was, I wouldn't say the easy part, but, you know, to get to a base camp or advanced base camp where the climbers are, um, you know, with the, right, with the right logistics, you can do it. Go, going up a mountain, climbing a physical mountain, that takes a whole different preparation, mental toughness. Um, we're not mountaineers, um, you know, and I, I'm a firm believer in the saying, you'd never get your capabilities and ambitions mixed up. It's so mm. true. Mm. Um, you know, we've seen people... Um, you know, try and be mountaineers and, and fantastic. They're having a go, but you know, to be honest with you, it's it's trekking is our is our base. It's our focus, and it's where we feel comfortable with. So let's talk about the, that whole fitness aspect of it, because I'm sure there's people listening. And as soon as you mentioned the word Himalayas, they went, "Well, not for me. I can't do that." But 
the reality is how, how fit does one need to be to do what you're particularly doing in going to these base camps? Look, look, I think you have to be, you have to have a general fitness. Um, strength is the key. Uh, we're lucky we train at a gym here in the northern beaches called Joe's Base Camp, um, who specialise in strength and conditioning. So it's not necessarily rocking up and doing a half hour aerobic session. So you need, you need to have a general level of fitness. And by that, you know, and again, that's going to depend on the trek. So Everest Base Camp is a good example um, where, you know, it's important to get out there, do some hills, some downhills too. Um, you know, and, and do you know two or three, four hour days. Um, some some others require a lot more than that. You know, pushing a sled. But you owe it to your fellow trekkers if you're going with a team to be fit because it'll allow you to have endurance. It'll allow you to get through each day because sometimes you've got to back up. You know, four, five, seven hour days, three or four days in a row. Um, sometimes longer. Mm. You also, I think it's important from a physical point of view, but also had to have a mental uh, preparation point of view. So that, that mental toughness, because it's, you know, and we've had it happen to us when little things add up to big things. And, um, you know, if you're in a tent, say, for two weeks, and let's face it, it's pretty basic, and even some of the tea houses we've stayed in are pretty basic, you know, and, um, you know, getting, you know, and it happened to us. So we, I'll give you the example. We got caught in the cyclone, uh, unbeknown to everyone and the cyclone that hit in 2014 in the Himalayas. Hmm. And a lot of people died in the Annapurna region, yep. uh, guides and trekkers. And some of them were prepared, some of them weren't, but it was unfortunate. We got the tail end of that. And so, you know, we just made it into camp in the afternoon. The heavens opened up, the clouds decided to be angry as hell. Um, you know, lightning, thunder, um, torrential rain, um, sheet metal flying off roofs of tea houses. Hmm. And we were in our little tent doing uh, eating alpine style and um, you know we, what do you do to go to the toilet hmm. um, okay you know you have a pee bottle most people have a pee bottle some people don't but there's no way I was going out of my tent to go and you know go to the toilet so to speak um, with sheet metal flying around and try and be decapitated so so there's a the little things that add up and you've got you know days after days of that or or the fact that you find the next day you, 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 you're trekking over ridges and there's been lots, lots and lots of snow. And um, you know, you, all you've got is your hiking boots and you're slipping and sliding and swearing and cursing, but hey, you've got to go on with it because you know the next point is over there type of thing. So it's, 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 it's actually really interesting because I think we see a lot of people, um, not so much in the Himalayas, because I think people go a bit more prepared, but we've seen people now, tackle the Tongariro crossing in Zealand for, in winter, for example, in thongs. Oh, really? Mm. Thongs and a, um, a cotton t-shirt. So if it rains, you're going to get hypothermia. Mm. But, but, you know, with no, and no water. Mm. And but say, I, would say, I, I would say to you, those people are obviously from either Invercargo or Tasmania. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> we Kiwis are tough, mate. <laughs> I know. And, and look, and you know what? That's that's the interesting things about Kiwis, right? You're always hiking shorts. Mm. I can't believe it. Yeah. Doesn't matter what the weather is, everyone hikes in shorts. <laughs> now, listen, you bring up a really good point about what you've been talking about um, in terms of that whole fitness thing. But I'm also hearing through that that the mental side of this is very important. And you can be as fit as hell, but if you're not strong in the mind and able to adapt to those things that you've been talking about, then that's going to blow the whole expedition apart as well. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean. We, we have a saying, and not to put a too fine a point on it, but 80% of it, our, our treks are mental and 20% is physical, obviously, you know, within variation of that. But it's so true. I mean, you know, I, you, you can be the fittest person, you can do run marathons, you can do triathlons, but it's, that, it's the mind that will get you through. You, your body will be willing, but sometimes your mind will just say, I've had enough, I'm going to give up. You know, I don't want to do this today. Um, it's too tough. I'm going to go home. Mm. You know, um, I want to go back and have a you know, cup of coffee and a Tim Tam type of thing. Something else I want to share around that that I experienced personally, and you brought it up earlier in the in the show today, and that was Mount Kinabalu. I remember when I climbed Kinabalu and I woke up um, in the middle of the night prior to the, the climb for the summit. My head was just about exploding from the altitude, and I'd never experienced that before on a mountain. And I, I was like, wow, this is just surreal. What's what's going to happen here? And I, I really had a fear that my head was going to blow up. Like, it was terrible. And, um, you know, I started gulping down the water and doing all the other things and, and came right when I got going. But I can imagine that this whole altitude thing and going to the places you're going to brings another dimension to it as well. 
So, same thing happened to, uh, to me on, on Kinabalu as well. So yeah, I mean, look, everyone gets a headache. It's, it's how you treat it, I suppose. But mm. um, headaches aren't uncommon at altitude. Um, you know, it can get very serious if you start throwing up or haven't eaten for a day or, or it manifests into something else, right? So everyone's got to play a part in watching out for each other and, and making sure everything's okay. But, but you're right. I mean, I think, I think with altitude is dangerous if you don't know how to treat it. Well, I think that's the thing I was trying to say in terms of, you know, we've all had headaches before. Well, a lot of us have had headaches before, but this is very different than a normal headache that you'd have at sea level. This is something that's about to blow your head apart from inside. It's like you've got 100 squash players in there that want to get out at the same time. So I, I think in terms of it's like anything in life, if we're, if we're that far out of our comfort zone for the first time, there's that adaptation process that we go through and we either deal with it or we don't. And it's almost that black and white, isn't it? Either we can put up with it or we can't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing is that I get very annoyed at, and again, you know, qualification, I'm not a medical expert, um, but, you know, I know enough um, about things to, to put my put my two bods worth in. But, you know, the, the important thing is uh, Diamox. So, you know, Diamox, um, people are recommended to take Diamox uh, when you're going to altitude, you know, before mm. you leave mm. um, or when you get to a certain altitude. To, to me, that's dangerous because a lot of people um, don't need to take it unnecessarily. And, and quite frankly, once you're on Diamox, uh, depending on the dose, and you do develop more serious altitude issues, um, you've got to come down. There's basically no option. Hmm. And, and I got really angry recently in, uh, in the Himalayas when I saw um, another trekking company advising some young Australians who are probably no uh, older than 18 years of age you know, you've got to do this and you've got to take this and take it now type of thing. And I was going, well, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, what, you know you're giving your, your, the people that are going with you false advice because mm. some of them don't even have, and I went around and a lot of them didn't even have a headache. Um, yep. a, lot of them were, a lot of them were sleeping really well, um, you know, drinking lots of water, eating healthy. They just arrived, for goodness mm. sake. Mm. And, and you were giving this advice. So it's, it's, you know, the important thing is if you're going to altitude, do your research, build knowledge, ask people about it. Um, but there are, there are various ways to mitigate, as you know. You, know, you took water. Um, to a lot of people taking, you know, half a litre of water, um, gulping it down um, helps. You know, mm. just doing, you know, taking a couple of Panadol helps. Yeah. Uh, keeping healthy, you know, climb high, sleep low. That's the mantra in the mountains. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so, look, yeah, it's, it can be serious, but there's ways and ways to mitigate it as well. Look, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I'd highly recommend anybody, um, particularly in this part of the world, getting to Mount Kinabalu to do that climb because it is absolutely spectacular. Uh, spectacular. I had a, I was very fortunate that I had a perfect day. It was just gorgeous at the top for the sunrise and uh, being able to look out over several countries and, and the ocean at the same time was really something that will live in my memory forever. Absolutely stunning. And, and actually, I want to go back and do it. It's funny you say that because... Uh, we, uh, fortunately for us, we had a, uh, uh, I can't remember the time of the year, but we had a monsoon, uh, it was this monsoonal weather. I mean, down at, down at, down at sea level, perfect up there. Just, just anyway, so, so the, the thing for me is I didn't see too much going up. I, I managed to cling onto the ropes and slipping and sliding and carrying on. But, uh, you know, as you say, once you get up there, the view is amazing, but, uh, I wouldn't mind having another crack at that because it's just a stunning, stunning mountain. It's in our own backyard. It's not that far from Australia, and uh, you yeah, know, I love, I love, I love the landscape and I love the people. Perhaps you can go back when they have the uh, the marathon and the half marathon up there. I saw the signposts on the side of the road with the times that the guys are running to get to the top yeah. of that thing. It was just absolutely insane how it, fast it they were doing that. Insane, and uh, you know, it took us three days to do the route burn track, and I think the record is just three hours to do the route burn marathon. So. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that Kinabalu climb is quite difficult in terms of um, the steepness of the steps and particularly in the beginning part, it seems to go on forever. And for a novice like me, I thought, hell, this, if this is going to get worse than this, I'm, I'm in big trouble here. Yeah? yeah, yeah. And and look, first time for us too, I had my son and daughter with me and I mean, being younger, they were clambering up, you know, sort of leaving me in the dust, so to speak. But, you know, uh, you know you've got that big granite rock when you finish the steps and because it was raining, it was slipping and sliding, and all you had was uh, obviously OH and S doesn't come to the mountain there. <laughs> no. So you know you're basically on your own and safety, and uh, you know clinging onto a rope as you're climbing up. But I mean, 
it's 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 not hard, but yeah, it's still it's still a, you know you're over four thousand meters when you reach the summit. Mm. Um, but but it's it's fun, you know. It's it's a it's a great little little mountain, and uh, as I said, I want to go back there again because I know I would tackle it differently. So there we go. Trevor and I are both recommending if you want to get off into the Himalayas, go and do Kinabalu first and <laughs> get get some experience at altitude. Yeah. Why, why not? Yeah. Why not? Okay, so let's get back to Project Base 8000. And I think the important thing I want to stress today is that this is a project that, that you and uh, Emma are doing together, but you're very much opening it up for other people to come along and, and, and join in. How, how do people go about that, Trevor? So we have our own website called projectbase8000.com and people can sort of contact us through that. Um, we're also pretty active on social media. So, you know, we'll be posting uh, very soon about our next trip um, to the Annapurnas. Um, but, but look, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's good fun. Um, you know, we like to go with people a bit like-minded and we've met a lot of people that have come back with us a few times um, that not necessarily focused on, on doing all 14 base camps, but they just want to do something and by, by putting it out there and um, saying to people, hey, we're going, why don't you come with us? Um, you know, we've had a few inquiries like that, which is great. Mm. Now, I want to put my corporate hat on for a second. Do you have a, a filtering process? Is there an interview process people need to go? You know, you say you want like-minded people, so how do you ensure that happens? I, you know what? By default, I think anyone wants to come with us is like-minded. <laughs> you know, that's that's how you put the filter on it. So look, I, it's very, very rare that you find when you're going with people um, from all walks of life, from any country, that you don't have something in common. Mm. Um, you know, and I promise if we go with any Americans, we don't talk about Trump. But, uh, <laughs> but apart from that, everything's, uh, you know, within limits. So look, it's, it's, it's just great to meet people from other countries from other cultures mm. and, and, and mingle with them and, and learn more about them. And I think that's, that's great, you know, for people, isn't it? It's, it's all about the person um, and, uh, you know, and, and just having fun with them. Just on that uh, thing about Trump, I'll probably have my American friends contacting me and say, well, we'll, we'll promise not to talk about the Australian prime minister, but we don't know <laughs> who it is actually. <laughs> had, had that comment a few times, yes. But, but then, I, then I talk to them about cricket and Aussie rules and they go mental because they don't know really what I'm talking about. So what happens in your household when there's a Kiwi-Aussie uh, match going on somewhere? R rugby uh, gets very heated. <laughs> as, 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 as no doubt with the Rugby World Cup for... Uh, uh, the finals coming up, that's going to be very interesting. So, yeah. I was going to say, you're going to be in for a rough month, mate. Probably, probably. <laughs> now, um, in terms of people coming with you, uh, are you setting an age limit? Do, do people have to be between a certain age to come with you on your, your project? No, 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 not at all. I mean, this is the exciting thing about trekking. You know, you can be you know, 16, 17, 18, whatever the age is, um, up to, you know, we've seen people in their 70s trekking. Um, there's a guy actually climbing mountains in the Himalayas at the moment, he's over 80 years of old age. Mm. Um, so, you know, age is no barrier. I mean, the, the important thing is you've got to have a willingness to do it. And more importantly, as I said, you know, you know do, do, do some training, um, but also, you know, get your head around it. And um, um, the important thing is at altitude, as you probably can attest, is you take it slowly. Mm. Um, you know, you don't go with the bull out of the gate. Um, so to speak, you, you don't race around. Um, you, you just you just walk, and um, hopefully the guide in the front will set the will set the tone, and normally they do. And uh, you just walk at their pace. And um, the important thing is just soak in the views, and sometimes the best views are behind you. So look, anyone's encouraged to come with us. Um, we 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 love people to come with us purely from the fact that, that it's more fun. Some people prefer to travel with a lot of creature comfort. So where does your project ranked on a scale of um, staying in bare basic accommodation up to luxury travel outlets? What's what's the kind of ranking system there? Oh, look, I, you know, it's 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 tents and tea houses. It's what it, whatever is available um, in the areas that we go to. So, you know, the important thing, I guess, is that we don't actually run the treks ourselves. We do that through a third party. So they do all the logistics and planning and uh, supply all the equipment. All we have to do is bring bring our gear with us and, uh, you know, kit bags are carried by porters or yaks or donkeys or horses or whatever the case may be, and you just carry a day pack. Mm. So so the great thing is that um, the accommodation is, is what it is. I mean, some of the accommodation now, um, especially in Nepal side and Tibet, it's, it's you know, really good tea houses. 
Um, sometimes, uh, like in Pakistan, for example, will be in tents because that's what's available. But the tent, tents, tents, sometimes tents can be more comfortable than the tea house. Um, mm. But you know, you make it your home. The important thing is you settle in, you make it your home, and uh, it's amazing how how you can adjust very quickly if you just uh, you know if you just make it your home. So your typical day trekking is it is it are you moving every day like you're packing down your tent you're going getting up in the morning and you're heading off to the next day or do you actually stay in some locations for one or two days? For acclimatization purposes, sometimes that happens. It depends on the altitude. Um, so normally you will have two, three, four days of acclimatization built in. That's why some people when they look at treks they go, "Wow, that's a long trek," but it's, that's a reason for that. You need your body to adjust to the, for, for the altitude. Um, you know, you can be on the go for two, three, four days on an end, then you might have a break. So, you know, you're talking three hour days, sometimes seven hour days. Um, if you have to go over a very high pass, say over 5,000 meters or more, you might be talking about a 10 or 12 hour day. So it, it does vary, but the good thing is you know about that before you book and you know about that um, because people give you briefings before you actually head off. So the, the important thing is that um, people understand what they're getting into and, and, and you will be well looked after as well. So no one's out to, to make sure that you don't succeed. Everyone wants to, you to succeed and everyone's out there to make, make sure that you get through the trek safely. Brings me on to something I read on your website. You said life-changing adventures with altitude and attitude. Tell me about the attitude part. <laughs> Well, mountains have a way of biting you in the in the ass or the ass, depending on which side of the world you come from, when you least expect it. And uh, by that, it, you know the weather can change dramatically from hour to hour. Um, you know, as I said, we've been caught out in the cyclone um, unexpectedly. You know, um, altitude can get you. Um, you just you just got to go prepared. Um, and uh, you know, we've even trekked, have to trek around landslides or be cut off by a landslide. Uh, rock falls, you know, avalanches. So, so you know, you just got to go prepared. So, so you know, we have a great respect for any mountain in the world. It doesn't matter where it is, and more importantly, um, you you have to sort of go with the equipment mm. that you are recommended to go with, and don't stray away from that. And uh, sometimes that means carrying a little bit more gear in your day pack than than what you expected. So, you know, seven or eight kilos. Uh, sometimes you go with less. Um, you know, always plan to go ahead with more water than what you need because um, if you're stranded or caught out, um, has you know, glamping arrived in the Himalayas yet? You've got to rely on what you have. To a certain extent, it has. I mean, there are mountain expeditions uh, from different mountaineering companies that offer that glamping version at, at Everest Base Camp. Um, you know, where they, they carry up a pizza oven or a big you know, coffee machine or uh, mm. a sauna. Um, you know, a sauna, wow. um, heated tents, yeah, heated tents. Uh, you know, bearing in mind this all has to be carried up. Um, but look, generally speaking, I would say not. Um, things are still basic in the Himalayas. Um, I mean, the tea houses can be as basic as you want them. Tent life can be as basic as you want up to, up to sort of having everything at your doorstep. So again, it really, de you know, mm. yeah, I guess you get what you pay for, you know, KV them to. Um, but but the most important things, there is some really really good stuff happening in the Himalayas. It's not all sort of destroying the environment. It's it's all about making sure people are looked after. The increase in tourism is happening. Um, we're seeing that more and more from say India and China. There's a lot more of those people coming in as opposed to um, you know Kiwis, Aussies, and that type of thing. Um, but, but, you know, we're seeing the increase of Aussies going there now too, which is great. Um, Americans always you know, have an attraction for it. People from the UK, all over Europe. So every nationality you can think of goes to the Himalayas. And, and you know, of course, they're all going to expect a different types of facilities um, to everyone else too. So again, it just, it just varies. But yeah, I, can't, I can't honestly say it's, you know, so it's changing, but, but for the better, not for the, for the, for the worse. I wanted to get your view on that because I see this, you know, there's been a lot in the press lately around the world about the commercialization. In particular, we've seen the stories about the gridlock on Everest this year and all those sorts of things. What, what's your viewpoint on the extensive commercialization of these areas? Oh, look, there's, there's no question that um, parts of it's being commercialized. Um, 
you know, people have different opinions about that. I think the weather has a big part to play. So from what um, I can... What's your, what's your opinion on the commercialisation specifically? Look, everyone to their own. I mean, if you want to pay big bucks to do climb a mountain, do it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of traditionalists out there that say, you know, if you climb the mountain with oxygen, then you're not a true mountain climber. Hey, you know, who are they to judge? Um, but it, it, I, th I think the important thing is to remember is that, you know, people, people often say to me, oh, how can you, you know, go with an expedition and, and um, hire all these porters and these porters don't want to carry your stuff. They want to go and farm the potatoes or tend to the yaks. And I go, well, you go and ask them what they want to do because, you know, some of these people will learn more in the season, in the two or three months of the season than what they can do in 12 months. So, you know, they want to send their kids to school. They want to educate their children the opportunities that they never had, um, that type of thing. And, and by help, you know, by employing people or by farming stuff out to different people in the, in the, in the Himalayas, for example, uh, especially porters, um, they get, they're going to be able to do that type of thing. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of people not hiring guides or porters. They go off and do their own thing, get lost as well. You know, I had a guy recently come up to me and said, I've got, uh, I've got uh, Google Maps, but my, obviously I don't have coverage, but I'm lost. I said, well, don't you have another map? No, no, I was lying on Google Maps. Right, so that, you know, he didn't have a guide. Um, he had some peanuts and that's all he had. So, mm. <coughs> you know. I've got a uh, bit itself, of a doozy really. question for you. So what's the difference between a mountaineer yep. using oxygen and a cyclist in the Tour de France using performance enhancing drugs. <laughs> you, tell, you tell me. <laughs> yeah. mm. I, I, look, I think, you know, I was, look, one, one is ridiculous. The other one is um, some people prefer to climb mountains with oxygen. Um, does it give them an edge? I don't know. I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But hey, you know, who are we to cast dispersions on people that want to achieve a goal or an ambition? Uh, to go climbing an 8,000 metre mountain. I mean, hmm. most times you don't need oxygen below 7,000 metres. I mean, that's a given. I mean, some people go on before then, but, you know, again, some people want to do it without. Some people consider, consider themselves to be real hardcore and decide not to climb an 8,000 metre mountain uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, obviously, you don't have to pay for oxygen. The oxygen cylinders will not carry them. So some people want to go it alone. Some people want to do it um, a little bit differently, but... I, I, you know, I, I think it's very, very hard to uh, draw a line between you know, performance enhancing drugs and, and the other one. So. Okay, well, I'm going to throw it out to the listeners. So if you're listening to this episode, I'd like to know what your viewpoint on that is. If you think that a mountaineer who uses supplemental oxygen to get to the top of one of the tallest mountains in the world is any different to a professional cyclist who's taking performance enhancing drugs in the Tour de France. So I'm really interested to see what people think about this one. Okay, um, we've got through a lot of stuff here, but I'm really interested in hearing a couple of things about the experiences that you've already had. So what are a couple of the most amazing scenic views that you've had already on the first six that you've done? Oh, I look, you know, view, views of uh, other 8,000 metre mountains, um, you know, coming across, uh, you know, wild animals, um, seeing, you know, footprints in the snow, of snow leopards, um, not actually seeing it, but seeing the footprints. Um, you know, just coming across, you know, people that um, you know. We come across one guy on, on the Kanchenjunga trip who ran a little tea house, and he, he was from um, um, far off in, in Tibet there. And basically, he just manned this little tea house in the middle of nowhere during the season. And um, you know, he had a little stove, a little yak stove, where he cooked all our food. You know, it was a very little little place where you could go and get your meals, and then you go back to your to your room, and um, you know, which was a, a tea house without a roof type of thing. Um, so you know, just just those type of people make the trip amazing, and um, you know, bumping into mountain climbers too. I mean, we we love you know talking to people that have been on expeditions or coming back from an expedition, and and uh, you know, did they summit, did they they didn't summit, and what what sort of caused that um experiencing expedition life wherever we can as well so it's, it's just all those interactions the culture the landscape uh the people um it's just just always experiences that you wouldn't normally get sitting in an office desk um in sydney hmm. 
Now, you and I and Emma and many of our listeners today are very entitled, privileged members of the Global Society. What was your first impressions when you first went to the Himalayan regions for the first time and, and saw what you saw as far as the poverty and the, the way that people live? Look, yeah, there's, no, there's no question um, there is a bit of poverty, especially in the cities. Um, the great thing about once you get out of the cities and into the countryside or up in the mountains, um, you've got a Buddhist culture. By and large, I mean lower down you might still have a Hindu culture, but up up the top you have a, a you know Buddhist culture, and you know, people have either ex ex you know, come across from Tibet or or Sherpas born in the valley, um, or higher up in, in their villages um, who you know go on to, to actually be guides guiding uh, people up up the mountains. So look, I think um, we've seen a lot of change. The Australian Himalayan Foundation are doing a lot of stuff, as I said, regarding health, education, and the environment in those areas. Um, but, you know, the important thing for us is that, you know, we want to give back, as I said, um, but more importantly, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of change. We're seeing kids go to school um, and they, they could take five or six hours to trek to school, you know, on a daily basis. But, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of change happening and, and it's not so evident until you go there and see that, see that you know. And, but as I said, in the cities, yeah, there's, there's child trafficking still going on. Um, you know, poverty is still a bad thing, but... But, you know, I think as a Westerner, we have a, a responsibility, if you, if you can say that, to, to actually condone that type of stuff and also, more importantly, help out wherever we can. Um, so, um, you know, yeah. So what would you say to people that would say to that, well, doesn't charity begin at home? You've got hundreds of thousands of people in Australia that are homeless. You've got a raging domestic violence uh, epidemic in the country. You've got uh, a big situation in New Zealand between the Maori community and the, and the Pākehā. What do you say about that? Without you running off trying to support other countries before, when you've got all these issues in your own backyard? Oh, well, not, not necessarily. I mean, I think, you know, the important thing is um, you do what you can at home as well. So it's just, it's just mm. not uh, one, you know, one, one or, or nothing. I think the important thing is a human being if you have compassion, then you have compassion. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Um, so has Project Base 8000 got some links to some charitable stuff in Australia, for instance? Or? Well, not, I mean, you know, as individuals, we, we go and do our own thing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we might donate, you know, here and there. Um, so, you know, yep. Salvation Army or whatever. So, so look, but, but yep. I think, you know, with the Australian Himalayan Foundation, and, and uh, we're still finding a charity in Pakistan because the HF only specialise in the Himalayas around Bhutan, um, Nepal, and, and sort of lower India. But, yep. um, you know, th th there's some great things happening. And, and even, even in our own countries, I mean, you know, it's not all bad and doom and gloom. I mean, I know there's issues, but at the end of the day, um, you know, there are, there are people out there, good people, doing the right thing. And um, I always like to see the goodness in people rather than the other side. So, yep. um, you know, we've, we've, we've chosen to do our thing, um, but it doesn't mean to say you don't have compassion in the home as well. Yeah, absolutely. I also read about how you make reference to this climbing in the high mountains or trekking in the high mountains as being kind of a spiritual experience. Can you share your thoughts around that with us? Yeah, look, look I think it's two things. Obviously, um, the mountains have their own spirituality. I mean, it's hard to explain um, people haven't gone there but once you go there you'll understand what I'm saying you know they have their own spirituality whether it's the you know the clouds around the mountains or the aura or looking at these you know in awe of these 8,000 meter mountains it's just amazing um, and you don't get that anywhere in the world um, mm. you know you might get higher mountains in Europe I oh, sorry when I say higher mountains you might get mountains of 4,000 meters or you know Mount Cook in New Zealand's over 4,000 meters but in in Australia I mean I look out here today and I'm seeing you know little hills you know, Mount mm. Kosciuszko is a hill, you know, yep. even though it's just yep. over 2,000 metres. But, um, and, and then more importantly, you know, it's the prayer flags, it's the culture, it's the Buddhist, it's that Buddhist philosophy. It's, it's the here and now, you know, living in the present moment. The fact that uh, what's mine is yours and yours is mine type of thing. There's no material possessions. Um, mm. You know, in our society, everything, you know, you've got to have the right car or drive the right car or live in the right house or... You know, live in the right area and send your, your kids to the right schools, right? You don't, you don't get that when you're in the mountains, you know, especially in the Himalayas mm. I'm talking about. Mm. Um, everyone's happy in, in terms of their life. Um, they're all going to school. The kids are going to school. 
Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, once you visit the Himalayas, you'll never be the same again. That's, that's, that's what changed us. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's made us appreciate life. It's made us appreciate the little things in life. But it's also, um, you know, made us appreciate the fact you don't have to have heaps of material possessions to be happy. Do your behaviour, is your behaviour different when you're over there versus being back in Australia, as an example? Um, to, a, to a certain extent, largely not. Um, however, mm. I, be, I guess when people travel, they become, they become tolerant, more tolerant than what mm. they would at home because mm. I think you see how the other half lives. But more importantly, uh, for us, we actually see how people live with nothing. And, mm. uh, you know, growing their own crops, li living off the land, um, you know, taking their stuff to market to sell, to raise money to send their kids to school, or people, um, you know, higher up becoming porters or guides to, um, you know, look after their family of, say, 10 people. You know, the grandparents, the parents, the, the kids, and get, give, give them the opportunity that they never had to send those kids to school. Give, give them an education to become doctors or engineers or, or whatever it is that um, they're striving to do. So, you know, and that's going to take time. And I think, you know, Nepal's, Nepal is a good example, and, and maybe Pakistan. You know, they're not, they're not affluent countries, but, hey, the people are amazing, you know, what they're achieving. And um, I, I'm, I'm in awe of those people purely from the fact they, they had nothing um, some of them still have nothing, but they, they get by it and they, they're laughing, they're, they're playing, you know, you kick around a soccer ball or take out a cricket bat. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's just, they're just having fun. Like, like we used to do when I was brought up in the country. That's how we used to have fun, you know, with nothing. Yeah. 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 Well, let's encourage as many people as we can, particularly of the younger generation, to get off their video games and off their iPhones and everything else and put a backpack on and get out and, and do this sort of stuff because as you've shared with us today it can change lives and more importantly it can inspire us to be better human beings yep, absolutely and then i think the great thing is that you know there are kids doing that right there's there's um you know duke of edinburgh schemes that the schools run in australia um you know yeah. i know a lot of parents now are, are taking their kids out there so to the outdoors so you know why, why not just go and do a day hike or a half day hike in your backyard yeah very good point Trevor, we could talk all day about this, I'm sure. I, I hear the passion in your voice and, and about the actual causes that you're involved in, but also the passion of hiking. And um, unfortunately, we've come to a time where we've got to close up the show. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you and Emma back after you've knocked off the last ones next year and come back on the show and talk to us again. Would you like to would do love, that? Would love to and um, <laughs> share, share some more experiences. And uh, I will put a uh, caveat on that too. Uh, we, we'll talk about the Rugby World Cup as well when you uh, come back. On. Only, only if Australia wins. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link to Project Base 8000 in the description of the show. So if any of the listeners out there want to get in touch with you guys and want to come and join you, put a backpack on, get over there into the Himalayas and Pakistan and change your life, then um, that's the way you can do it. So Trevor, thanks very much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. So there we go. That was Trevor Builder, currently living in Sydney, Australia, but trekking around the Himalayas and Pakistan on Project Base 8000. I'm sure you agree there was plenty of great nuggets in there. If you're about to leave your career and go off and traveling around the world, then Trevor gave us a great insight as to some of the things that you can expect when you do that. Also, what uh, the wonderful benefits of getting out there and seeing the world and also being compassionate enough to start a cause to help other people, whether it be at home or in other countries. I do hope you enjoyed that episode. So if you're looking for more episodes from the Global Travel Channel podcast show, simply go over to our website at www.globaltravelchannel.com. You will find all of our previous episodes there. And if you want to download our episodes, you can find them easily on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and a host of other locations that are also listed on our website. Don't forget, if you like our content and you'd like to share it with your friends and family, please do so. We're trying to get as many people around the world involved in the Global Travel Channel podcast show as we possibly can. Okay, that's it for me on this episode. My name's Mark Philpott. Until next time, I wish you all bon voyage.